Okay, hello and welcome to chapter nine, which is all about acids, bases, and buffers in the body. This is gonna be the part one of this webinar and of this chapter, and this uh, obviously will help you with, uh, with your acid and base content. Okay, so this is where we're gonna later on introduce, um, in addition to acids and bases, of course, pH, the concept of a dissociation uh, constant, Ka, as it's uh, known. And we'll also be talking about transport of acids or bases through cellular membranes, and that's gonna occur in the latter part of the webinar. So, and it won't be in this part, but it'll be in subsequent parts. So uh, let's first start off and talk about the definition of an acid. Well, Arrhenius definitions of acids include the dissociation that will produce the hydrogen ion H plus. Okay. So, and if you have the molecule hydrochloric acid, of course, <laughs> I'm already giving it away, but if it was just hydrogen chloride, right? And if it was in the gas phase and if water was present, it would dissociate into H plus and Cl minus. Okay. Uh, a cation and an anion, if you will. And that particular cation H plus is going to be referred to sometimes as a proton. We've already used that that term um, before and uh, you can still use it here as well. Now that would be the Arrhenius de definition. The Bronze de Lowry definition uh, to discusses acids that are compounds that donate the hydrogen ion or proton, the H plus. So in this particular case you would have water plus the H plus um, entity and then it would yield this uh, hydronium ion. Where would that H plus come from? It would come from for instance if you had hydrochloric acid again. So it's just you know, it's just, it is a matter of vernacular, of course, what is the definition? Both are considered reasonable, of course, and and you can use them. Just be clear on what you're talking about. So, you know, the Arrhenius definition, acids dissociate and they produce the, the hydrogen ion or the proton. The Bronze de Lowry definition, acids are compounds that donate that hydrogen ion. Okay, so in, in contrast, then let's talk about bases. So bases are ionic compounds that associate in water to produce the metal ion and hydroxide ion, stuff like sodium hydroxide, right? So if that is dissociating in water, it would produce the sodium cation and the hydroxyl group, okay? The hydroxide in this particular case. That would be an ionic compound, the sodium hydroxide. So in a beaker, if you had, you know, um, you filled it up with water and then you admitted some of the sodium hydroxide. We did this a little bit um, with respect to the soap, although um, it wasn't, yeah, we added a, a, a bit of water. Ultimately, we added this to uh, the oil formulation, the oil and fat formulation to help with the, um, with the base catalyzing of the triglycerides from the oil in order to help get that going and forming the fatty acid salts, which we, you know, then called soap. But in this particular case, you have the hydroxyl group, you have the sodium cations, and they dissociate in water. Uh, they are created by that dissociation of the sodium hydroxide in water, and that would be considered then an Arrhenius base. The Bronze de Lowry definition of a base are bases that are going to accept the hydrogen cation. So you have one, the bronze lowry donates the hydrogen cation, well that's going to be an acid. If it accepts the hydrogen ion, then that's going to be an H+. Um, so for instance, the water molecule, right, would be the base that leads to the hydronium ion because the water is going to accept that proton. So it's probably not too difficult, but that's just something to be aware of. Okay, water as an acid or or base. Let's discuss this a bit. So if you have hydrogen chloride and you have water, as we've shown on the last slide, hydronium ion will be created as well as the chloride ion. Now, oftentimes, this H3O is not typically referred to in any kind of chemical reaction. Usually, we just leave that as the H+. Okay. But if you really want to be pedantic about it, then we can say, look, water is the base and it did accept the H+. And this is why you would do that. You would say, well, the water accepted the H+, plus, hydronium ion, i.e. H3O+, plus, was formed. Now, if we're talking about water as an acid, then you start with ammonia, and water is present, then it can form ammonium cation there, and it can also form the hydroxide group, okay? Again, in this particular case, we're using water, but unlike the hydronium uh, presence, we don't have that because the hydrogen that was, that had been evolved, actually, combined, 
and now you have the ammonium ion, the NH4+, relative to the ammonia original um, reagent there. And of course, the hydroxide ion forms as well. So you have acid, uh, the water being an acid, it donates H+, and you have ammonia being the base, it accepts that H+. So just another way of looking at that, and it's just another way of uh, looking at the flexibility of water as either a base or an acid. And this is one of the reasons why Water is considered like a universal solvent. It's you know found in in, in virtually everything uh, that we that we that we have our hands on on a on a daily basis. Really, I mean, look, I mean, if you have cleaners, if you have you know um, any kind of uh, cosmetic, you know, or or any kind of medicament, even like toothpaste, right? That has water in it. So I mean, water is so flexible. <clears throat> now there are things that. You cannot have with water, obviously, like gasoline and such, but then again, it's not supposed to, right? I mean, that the intent of that is not to create any kind of dissolution event. That's really just to help drive a combustion event. So water is not so good at that, as we know. Okay, so let's look at some examples of strong and weak acids and bases. So this um, bears from problem 9.6, and it says identify the acid, which is the proton donor, and the base, which is the proton acceptor in the following. You have the carbonate dissolved in water, so it has the AQ for aqueous phase, plus water, and it's liquid, and it's an equilibrium, right? If the arrows are going both ways, then you have equilibrium, and you form the hydrogen carbonate, and then you form the hydroxyl group, known as the hydroxide ion, and everything is in the water phase, so you still have the AQ for the aqueous phases. All right, so if we need to look and see, well, what's going on, what is water in this particular case doing? Well, if you look on the left, right, right beside it, you have the carbonate ion. You look on the right, it's a hydrogen carbonate, right? So obviously, you know, the water in this particular case is donating that proton, right, to be able to create that hydrogen carbonate species as well as the hydroxide species. So not hard. If you have an acid, you're going to have a corresponding base as well. So the carbonate in this particular case is going to function as that base. If you had sulfuric acid plus water and it creates, wow, the hydrogen sulfate, right? Or the hydronium ion, what's going on here? Well, you know that, you already know that, you know, sulfuric acid is already an acid that kind of gives it away. So if that's going to be the acid, then the water is going to be the base. But let's look and see what happens here. You see hydrogen sulfate has two hydrogens initially. What does it have on the right-hand side? Only one. So it lost one of the hydrogens. And where did it go? It got picked up by the water molecule to form the hydronium species. So that's another way of checks and balances and just slowing down and being able to identify just where are the atoms uh, coming and going, really. And then you, you're able to, to uh, figure that out. So here we have very simple carboxylic acid. Acetic acid plus water. What's going to happen there? Partial dissociation. This is a weak acid system, okay? In a weak acid system, you're not actually going to have all of that kind of one, you know, unidirectional, the arrow goes only one way, you know, from, uh, from the left to the right, you're actually going to have these equilibrium, you know, situations. So, you know, in problem 9.6, I didn't, you know, we didn't talk about the strong weak acids. Here we are, you can tell above in that, uh, in that upper part that the sulfuric acid is obviously a strong, Dissociation as indicated by the unidirectional arrow pointing from left to right. With the carbonate, left to right uh, equilibrium, so you know that's going to be a weak, a weak, <clears throat> a weak base in that particular case. So with respect to the weak acid, and you have the carboxylic acids, which are generally going to be a weaker acid that that produces partial dissociation, or let's at least you know we'll have some some equilibrium uh, as well. You know you're going to have the acid as being well the acid and the water is going to function as the base in the strong acid full dissociation again the acid is still the acid and the water is the base so all of that is going to be pretty clear if we're talking about bases though weak bases and strong bases then we have to look at that differently so like in the previous slide we just showed that water can split to form the hydronium species plus the hydroxide species in this particular case water is the acid right? And ammonium, ammonia is the base. We can converts to ammonium. Now, what else do we have? Strong base. In this particular case, sodium hydroxide. Basically, any kind of alkali group. So, you're looking at 
anything uh, in that group one periodic table uh, where you're looking at uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, things like this, those are all gonna uh, pr provide full dissociation whenever they're linked up with the hydroxide group, okay? So sodium hydroxide links up with water, while water is again gonna be the acid in this particular case, sodium hydroxide is the base and these ions are formed. Always remember that strong acids and strong bases will produce salt. And I have a demo coming up um, that uh, you can view that will reinforce that. For instance, here's calcium hydroxide. This would be an example of a group two element. So although we just discussed group one as being strong, guess what? Group two is also strong. You have beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, those kinds of um, elements in that group two are going to be able to form strong bases when coupled with the hydroxyl group. So here in this particular case, we have calcium hydroxide. It's a solid, right? And just like how sodium hydroxide was a solid, you add it to liquid uh, hydrogen bromide and calcium bromide is formed as well as water. Sometimes this AQ is, is further denoted because although it may exist as a solid and precipitate out, if there's an abundance of water or even if there's just, you know, a reasonable amount of water present, it may, some of it will actually still stay uh, dissolved within that water solvent. So that's just part of that. But if you were to look at this, obviously you know that hydrogen bromide is going to be the acid and calcium hydroxide is going to be the base. We're just being very, you know, just trying to, to be very pedantic as, 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 as the term calls for, just to make sure that we know what's going on. Uh, six common strong acids that, that you should know about, perchloric acid, sulfuric acid, hydroiodic acid, hydrobromic acid, hydrochloric acid, and nitric acid. These acids are very common. In fact, if anybody is involved in pool chemistry, one way is to get your pool shifted to more, uh, well, to, to lower the pH. I, you know, you know, nobody wants to have an, 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 an acidic pool. <laughs> That's not going to be healthy for your skin. Uh, or or your body, just in general, but you might treat the pool depending on what kind of pH that it currently is at and depending on if you got any kind of algae that had crept in there because it, it always does. You always have to keep up on this. If you have a pool, uh, you would use perchloric acid, for instance, and hydrochloric acid. Those are just some examples of, of how those come into your daily life. Uh, sulfuric acid, is very common. I already showed you in some of my other in-class demonstrations uh, the, the dehydrating power of sulfuric acid with respect to sugar, right? It was able to create that carbon kind of morass uh, in the beaker and it did so very well and it and it was, uh, you know, elevated a bit in that beaker just because of the gas evolution that, that also occurred that's, you know, uh, during that during the dehydration. So, but that's also battery acid, right? That can, that helps to power some of these long life uh, batteries, some of these marine batteries. Um, hydroiodic and hydrobromic, you don't typically um, see these very much used on an on a everyday basis. Not to say that they couldn't, but you just don't see that. Nitric acid, nitric acid is actually a really interesting acid. And the origin of this has to be, um, you know, traced back to antiquity, really. And, um, nitric acid was especially important by the alchemists who had originally devised this, at least in the written word, right, in their documentation of being able to help extract gold from various uh, compounds uh, whenever they were dissolved or heated. So nitric acid is very important there. And uh, the turning, you know, turning, I guess, junk, quote unquote, to gold would be, uh, would be then attributed to in part the the alchemist and the and their creation of the, of the nitric acid. And of course, nitric acid is still important today. So alchemy still continues to uh, benefit chemists and processes used in today's world. So with respect to nomenclature, if you were going to, you know, name these things, you would just replace, right, uh, the suffix with some different, you know, ends, like the i, the eight, the it. So in this particular case, if you had cyanide, the CN, if you were to form an acid, that'd be hydrocyanic acid, HCN. If you had hypochlorite, that would be hypochlorous acid. And if you had nitrate, that would be nitric. Okay, so you would have the ic <laughs> kind of replaced with the eight. You would have 
um, the I'd replaced, right? Also with the ick, I don't have an example here given with respect to, um, to any other molecule, but if you have the us, that's going to replace the it. So hypochlorite goes to us, I goes to ick, and it goes to ick as well. So it sounds like some kind of funky naming thing that we're doing. So, and if you were going to do that with respect to iodide, you would say hydroiodic acid, and that would be the HI. Perchlorate would be perchloric acid, HClO4. Acetate would be acetic acid, okay? Bromide would be hydrobromic acid, and chlorate would be Chloric acid, nitrate, nitrite, just look at the it, right? You know it's going to be an us, so that's going to be a nitrous acid. So pretty straightforward kind of practicing there. I think it's I think it's helpful to go through that. It kind of takes us back a little bit to chapter three, maybe even a little bit of chapter four in terms of naming uh, conventions, what we had already done previously, but hopefully that helps. Now here's going to be some example of some common neutralizing compounds. Remember how I said that strong acids and strong bases will precipitate or form a salt. Okay, so you have the base being the magnesium hydroxide, you have hydrochloric acid being the strong acid in this particular case. So is this ever used? Well, uh, yeah, it can have a, you know, a laxative effect, of course, so, uh, you, you know, you have to think about that, but here are some basic compounds that are used um, in some what they consider antacid, something that's going to be able to counter that strong acid. So anything, anything that's denoted to be an antacid is going to counter a strong acid, strong acid like hydrochloric acid. And remember, in our stomach, we have hydrochloric-like acid. They call it gastric acid. The pH of that is really low. It's two or even lower. And so if anybody's having an upset stomach and it's too acidic in that particular case, then usually that's going to be countered with a base. In other words, you don't want a, a strong base too. Like a, you don't want to just take and drink a bunch of water to quell that quote unquote sour stomach, right? Or, or, or indigestion, the burning, you know, whatever you're feeling there. Water alone isn't going to be able to do it. Although water can function as a base, it's not a strong base. Okay, strong bases are generally going to have these group one or group two elements, right? The alkali or the alkaline or, okay? So if you're looking at aluminum hydroxide, although that's not either of those two first two uh, choices, this is also a, a metal cation that can have a strong effect in neutralizing an acidic environment. Milk and magnesia, that's magnesium hydroxide, just like what we have up here, okay? Mylanta, Malox, Digel, Gelasyl, Ripopan, okay, magnesium hydroxide or aluminum hydroxide. Notice that, you know, these things are still being uh, formulated with the same type of compounds, really. Bicetol, okay, uh, calcium carbonate, magnesium hydroxide. You have Tums, which is just calcium carbonate, okay, something a little bit softer, and then, which is definitely going to produce a little bit of um, uh, gas evolution, so you might burp or you just might have, well, flatulation. Alka-Seltzer, again, you have the evolution of carbon dioxide, which is, which is you know, it can go both ways, really. But all those are some antacids, okay? So all of these things can have those kinds of effect. You would take them for different uh, reasons, of course. They can lead to constipation. This is the kind of stuff that can back you up. I mean, in fact, back in the day, astringents were highly sought after. When I say back in the day, I'm talking about um, medieval time during the Renaissance period, things like this, because people would have uh, runny bowels, okay? And this was just a just a fact of life. In fact, uh, during during war and battling periods, you know, all the soldiers, if they were just standing around, well, I mean, <laughs> you know, we, we talk about disease and how it could be communicated. It could be especially communicated during those times, especially in the absence of proper nutrition or cleanliness, right? The hygiene might not have been adequate and it's really important to have your latrine your bathroom area pretty much uh confined to a to a to a given space that's going to be well you know at a you know definitely <laughs> more than an arm's length grow from, from from the housing okay so the barracks and the latrine areas would have to be widely separated at least a football field and if that wasn't then sometimes you would get some of the some of the bleed over 
that would result from that, especially if it's raining or if it's a humid environment, things like this. So how do you fix some of that runny valves that's, that soldiers and just that people would ultimately end up having anyway? You would use an astringent, okay? So aluminum um, compounds are definitely great for, for stopping up, um, you know, any kind of uh, too wet or, or, or seemingly seeping areas, okay? So not that that, I mean, that does get a little bit graphic and stuff, but that's just, you know, again, the fact of life. So anybody who could find alum, you know, deposits was going to do pretty well because that could help, you know, it, you could be, alum is used for a lot of different things. You could also use that as a dye uh, fixant in the material. They call that like a dye mordant. But it could also be used for for your own hygiene, your uh, personal hygiene benefits. So um, it shouldn't be surprised then that if you see the aluminum hydroxide here, or even the magnesium hydroxide, please know that that, can, that, that uh, definitely has constipation, like a, you know contra effects, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, you could have a, a laxative effect actually, depending on you know um, the quantity of this of this particular base, the magnesium hydroxide that you have. So you can notice that with respect to this mylanta and stuff and where you have actually the presence of two of these ingredients, you can see how they're trying to, you know, counter one versus another one, right? How do you, how do you counter the laxative effect? Well, you can add an agent that will lead to constipation, but then you can't just have the constipation. So, you know, it's just, you know, organized like that. So just kind of interesting. Uh, always remember that we had discussed the kidney before. There is risks in having too much calcium in the body. Okay, so if already there's going to be some issues with, with handling acids and obviously elimination of body fluids, calcium is going to be a concern. So in this particular case, you know, you have calcium, you have magnesium. Those are the agents. Those are the metal um, species and in ionic form. They're going to be really willing to coordinate to other anions, especially oxalates, in order to form some of these stones. Uh, carbonate is also... Uh, one of those constituents, right? Sub substituents in uh, a kidney stone because calcium carbonates don't really dissolve exceptionally well. So just as an example. So just know that all of this can lead to some of these effects, but these are things that you should definitely become aware of because as you move forward you know, in your in your nursing training and stuff, and even just, just in life, it helps to know what are you taking and why and what are the potential um, ramifications from that. So just kind of interesting. So I just talked about uh, neutralization of strong acids. So please watch the video. And I did post it on YouTube and here's a link for it. But this is where I use sodium carbonate. And you can also use baking soda as well. And I combined it with hydrochloric acid. I used diluted uh, amount. I think it was about 7% uh, that I used in the video just because I didn't want to have something too caustic. Because honestly, it it's pretty potent. I mean, and if you are going to do this, so, you know, you might... You, you might ask yourself, well, am I ever going to have a need to neutralize a strong acid? Well, you might, uh, especially if you might be cooking, okay? Um, and if you always have an environment where um, you're going to have some acids around, whether you're cleaning, okay? Notice that I say the hydrochloric acid is very common. It's used uh, for bath and tile cleaners. It has typically less than about 10%. It's also used in the, in the well, it's, it's also used to clean efflorescence and stuff from uh, pavers and stuff. Usually it's sold as muriatic acid. Muriatic acid is kind of an antiquity term. Therefore, hydrochloric acid, concentrated hydrochloric acid is generally over 40%. It doesn't get much higher than that. I guess it could get up to maybe 48%. But know that muriatic acid is still very concentrated and it can, it can evolve some, some pretty powerful fumes. So always practice safety. So if you're ever going to neutralize anything, goggles, masks, gloves, well-ventilated space, this is so important, okay? And why is this important? Because you're going to have significant bubbling and liquid elevation. As I show in the video, you have to check it out. CO2 will be produced, okay, if you're using the sodium carbonate or baking soda to help promote, promote that kind of um, uh, evolution. But that's not the only thing that will, that will be produced. Um, oftentimes, uh, you can also get a bit of chlorine gas, okay? So this is another reason why things should be well ventilated. I don't have that in the description up here. And, you know, um, but please know that you can have chlorine gas as being one of the potential uh, gases that are evolved. So, and you'll know it because it'll have that kind of pungent 
uh, kind of striking um, sting to you. Like um, you'll notice it if you're even if you're not trying to breathe it, um, but it might even uh, sting the eyes a little bit. So it's basically mustard gas. Okay. So uh, if you use something like a carbonate, that helps to really uh, limit how much chlorine gas could be evolved. It doesn't again, it doesn't work all the time. It all depends on many other conditions, of course. But the goal is that you're trying to get sodium chloride to precipitate. Okay, that's the salt form. And if you have excess, and always use excess of the baking soda or, or sodium carbonate, because that doesn't matter. It's a benign substance. You can use washing soda in your <laughs> in your laundry washing machine. You can use baking soda to actually bake with. I mean, this stuff is very, it's very cheap and it's widely available and it will not cause harm. So it's okay to use more than what you should. In fact, I really like this action because if anybody's ever going to be uh, experimenting with chemicals, I think it's really important to know, well, how do you neutralize something? You can't just, you know, take these acids and just pour them straight down the, the drain. Or if it was a, a caustic substance, you just don't want to throw that in the trash because you don't want, you know, whoever's going to, you know, the janitorial services or, or whoever might have been rummaging, you know, through the gas to clean it or the trash to clean it up. Or somebody actually dropped something in the trash and then they go and retrieve that, you know, because it was by accident to see an open container. You don't want them to be exposed to to a chemical. So a responsible way of doing this, you know, is trying to neutralize that threat. And that threat here in this particular example will be hydrochloric acid. So this is a good demo uh, for you to watch. So uh, please do so. And, um, and, and hopefully this can also help you in future situations. I mean, never know. Uh, also realize that this is an exothermic reaction. Okay. So let's look at some more neutralization examples. This is these correspond to problems 915 and 918 in your book. So you have nitric acid plus lithium hydroxide. You think that's going to be a pretty, you know, strong reaction? Yes, you have a strong acid, you have a strong base. So if you combine them together, you're going to form the lithium nitrate, right? It'll be an aqueous um, phase. Again, it could also precipitate out as a solid. Again, it depends on the water level and depends on how much of one you add it over the other, you know, there, all, all of these things matter, but just know that that is the salt that is formed, even if it is dissolved in a water environment, okay? Sulfuric acid plus calcium hydroxide, calcium sulfate. Um, let's try to think of another one. You know, you could even use calcium carbonate to a certain degree too. In that particular case, you would evolve out carbon dioxide as well. In, you know, instead, instead of only water. So if calcium carbonate is available instead of calcium hydroxide, use that. Sulfuric acid and sodium uh, hydroxide, there shouldn't be a two there. I'm going to uh, correct that in the slides. You're going to get uh, sodium sulfate and you're going to get water. Sometimes sodium sulfate is used. Sodium sulfate may be used and recommended because it's solid whenever it is dehydrated from the water, right? So if it settles out, it's a solid. Why might that be of interest? Because it's easier to transport salts than it is caustic liquids. And if uh, hydrochloric or I should say uh, sulfuric acid is needed then, or and it's mostly needed through that sulfate species, then that can be done by well, dissolving sodium sulfate in the water. You have um, HBr, lithium hydroxide, lithium bromide, right, and water. Hydroiodic acid, calcium carbonate. Again, here's a great example I just mentioned before. You can use calcium carbonate calcium iodide and carbon dioxide gas. Okay, make sure you balance it the proper way. Hydro, uh, um, hydrobromic acid and aluminum hydroxide, well, aluminum bromide and water, nitric acid and magnesium hydroxide, you get magnesium nitrate and hydrochloric acid and uh, sodium bicarbonate, you get the CO2 production, so along with the sodium chloride. So hopefully all those are good examples. Again, um, you know, I'll be fixing the NaOH. It should, it should just be NaOH, not NaOH2 uh, typos, man. I'm going to work on my editorial budgets. Got to, got to boost that. Um, now, let's talk about chemical equilibrium. So we talked that uh, if you have strong acids and bases, the direction of that yield sign is going to go from reactants to products. The products are not going to necessarily want to go back to reactants, right? I mean, that's a no-no. If you're dealing with weak acids and weak bases, then they are allowed to go from products back to reactants. Here is where we need to talk about chemical equilibrium, then, because that is going to be 
invoked here with respect to those kinds of processes. So as soon as we say equilibrium, then we're probably not going to be talking about very strong acids or very strong bases, right? So let's look at Le Chatelier's principle. The reaction rate and therefore equilibrium will flex to offset reaction conditions. That's my paraphrasing of it. What does that mean? Equilibrium means the reaction occurs at the same but opposite rate. So there's a bunch of different adjustments that can be made to the reactant or the product side of the reaction in order to encourage either the reactant or the product, okay? So for instance, you have concentration and you have temperature. So those are just two common uh, common factors in trying to uh, influence the, um, the disequilibrium, I guess, of a given reaction. So for instance, if a reactant was added, well, then the reaction is going to shift towards the right. So the more reactant you have, then the more product, which is going to be on the right-hand side, is going to be produced. If you remove the reactant, then it's not really going to produce a whole lot of product. Things are going to stay pretty much unreacting. So remember, whenever things are going to be reacting together, it's important that those reagents or those molecules, those reactants, are going to be contacting one another. If you remove the volume or the mass of one of those reactants, then the likelihood of contacting, and that's what's required for a reaction to occur, is going to be diminished, okay? So if you add a product, then the reactant's gonna shift more towards the left to try to balance it out. If, if, the, if you remove the product, obviously things are gonna go towards the right. Again, temperature, if you raise the temperature of the endothermic reaction, which is gonna take in energy in order to make that product form, the reaction is going to uh, shift towards then to the right. If you're going to lower the temperature of the endothermic reaction, meaning that the that the reaction, those reagents, can't draw enough energy, enough heat energy from the environment in order to make those products form, well, then they're going to be stuck as reactants. So the reaction is going to shift to the left. If you're going to raise the temperature of an exothermic reaction, that's going to be too much. On the product side, it's going to say, well, I can't produce as much heat in the formation of these products because there's already a ton of heat over here on my products uh, side. So I don't want to react anymore. The reactants then are going to be more favored and then therefore not react. But if you lower the temperature of the exothermic reaction, well, then it shifts towards the right. So this would be um, an example of, you know, you can't, uh, it's a lot easier to heat a fire than, if, well, first of all, if it's dry and if it's cold, right? So you lower the temperature of the exothermic reaction, then you're going to be able to strike that match and kindle, the, you know, the wood or the or the or the twine or the leaf, you know, dry leaves in order to get that reaction to start, you know, commencing. And when it does so, it's going to it's going to push that, you know, to the right. Now, once everything's already going on and there's already a fire started, then it's easier, you know, to keep that going on. But the conditions have to be right. Um, in order for an exothermic reaction to occur. So that's also of interest as well. So let's look at that in some detail. So if you have nitrogen and you have hydrogen and that, that process, whenever they're combined, can form ammonia, which was a really important process that was uh, discovered in the early 20th century um, during wartime efforts. Obviously, this can also help uh, with uh, fertilization, but this is a very important uh, reaction. If you add an abundance of nitrogen and the hydrogen is kept the same, then you're going to have equilibrium shifting towards the product side. And notice how I use the larger equilibrium arrow here relative to the arrow going from product to reactant. Okay, so the reactant to product area, her arrow is way bigger and it's bigger because there's more nitrogen that had been added. The rate of ammonia production then increases shifts towards the products. If you remove hydrogen, in other words, make it small, guess what? The products are not going to be favored, okay? The rate of ammonia production goes down and the reaction shifts towards the reactant. So I tried to uh, color code that and give you some animations there. I hope that helps. Let's look at temperature real quick. If you had ammonia uh, formed from nitrogen and hydrogen, okay, you either have heat that's added or you have coolness, right? Uh, going from uh, ammonia product to the individual reagents. Let's see what happens if you add heat to the reactants or remove heat from the product. So as ammonia is being formed, maybe that uh, 
that cylinder, that uh, chamber is being reduced in temperature, then guess what? You're actually going to form more ammonia. Okay, so that's just one example of it. The rate of production is going to increase, but this is another example. If okay, you add heat to the products, so if this is already warm, okay, and it's and it's going to create more heat in doing that. Then again, like we said on from the previous slide, the reaction is not going to favor the products; it's going to favor the reactants. Uh, likewise, you can also cool the reactants down, and that will actually slow and reduce the ability of those rea reactants to actually combine them with each other and touch each other. Right? It's like everything is moving in slow mo, and if the if the reactants are kept on in in a, in a very low temperature, and you're just not going to get that that environment. It's going to be favorable for the production of ammonia. So then you have a much greater uh, likelihood of just having the reagents existing. So hopefully that helps explain a little bit of the of Chatelier's principle, chemical equilibrium, concentration, and temperature dependence of these reactions to help you fa favor either reactants or products. Um, now, Knowing that, then we can start talking about chemical equilibrium in terms of an actual constant. So one thing that we haven't talked about is, well, what is the rate of that? And what, and what would that look like? Um, or maybe not even the rate here, but what would be some kind of constant value that could let us know whether reactants or products are going to be formed? So I think that that's a, a valid question. I think that that's you know, what we have to answer. And that's actually one of the more important aspects of this chapter where we start introducing these dissociation constants or these reaction constants. So in this particular case, we can look at, again, nitrogen and hydrogen coming together, right? They have to interface. Let's assume that the concentrations are just enough, right? You like, you have uh, the correct stoichiometry here. It's a one, three, one ratio. Let's just say all that's fixed. We don't have an excess of any one particular reagent. We don't have weird uh, temperature, const you know, constraints affecting us, like the left-hand side isn't, uh, you know, cooled down and the right-hand side isn't like really heated up. You know, let's just say everything is at room temperature and everything's working out pretty well. So what we need to do is we need to try to figure out uh, an expression that can help us determine whether uh, that reaction uh, will go to the right or left, depending on, you know, influences that we make to either the reactant or the product side we would introduce then a term called K, and K is going to be that essentially uh, equilibrium constant, okay? And the K is given by a ratio, right, of products to reactants. And what do we know about the products and reactants? We don't know their temperature per se, like I don't know the exact temperature of each one of the ammonia molecules there. I mean, we could definitely have micro thermometers probably attached, well, I guess a probably nano at that point. Uh, but we don't do that. There's a way easier way of doing this. We do this by measuring concentration. Okay, so we know what the concentration, or i.e. how much we're adding of nitrogen or hydrogen, and we also know then how much of the ammonia, for instance, in this case, would be produced. Concentration is going to be denoted with brackets around the given molecule. So NH3 is going to be bracketed. This immediately indicates to us, it informs us that we're going to be talking about concentration. Okay, and you have A and plus B and goes to C plus D. And these uh, prefixes, these scripts, lowercase a, b, c, d, indicate the power. When I say the power, that's basically the exponent in which these concentrations are going to be raised. Okay, so in this particular case, uh, for the ammonia, first of all, we have no D molecule, right? So we only have product of C. Okay, C is going to be NH3, and it's going to be bracketed to indicate concentration. What is the prefix of ammonia? It's one, right? So you have the power of one. If you then look at the reactants, you look at nitrogen, you have the brackets there, indicating that we're talking about the concentration of nitrogen. And then you have the exponent there, or the power of one, because there's only one mole. A is one. Hydrogen, it's not one anymore, it's what? Three. So B equal three, and so that's how you would you would relate that problem. Okay, we're not going to be doing a ton of work that's going to explore actual content values of, um, you know, how much nitrogen 
would would influence ammonia. I mean, we might see this a little bit, but in this course, we're not meant to explore this to any significant degree. Okay, you would if you were to take uh, more of a, a chemistry only, you know, general chemistry only focused course like uh, like like Chem 150 or something. Uh, actually, probably Chem 160 uh, Part Two. That's where that would be done. But at least you're able to get a feel for what is going to happen here. So if we look at this table, table 9.4, and this is from your book, we have the value of K, K equals one, K is greater than one, K is less than one. What's going on? Well, predominant species at equilibrium. If K equals one, guess what? Everything is the same and equilibrium is maintained. Nothing is going to the left or right. Everything is, is hunky-dory, just hanging out. Reactions are likely to proceed to the right as they are to the left. In other words, reactants and products are both likely to form at the same rate. But if you have a K greater than one right here, then that means that products are gonna to wanna to be formed. If you have K of less than one, then reactants, okay, are gonna be dominating. So K is greater than one, you know that this concentration of NH3 is going to be way high, okay? If the reactants are gonna be in greater amount, uh, then we have to use our math, you know, experience here. One divided by a very large number is a very small number. Well, K less than one, that means that reactants are going to be favored. Okay. So I tried to uh, express this in terms of very, you know, um, you know, uh, well, just using words actually uh, mixed in a little bit with the, with the ratios that you would have you know, for, for constructing these equilibrium equations to try to help you under, better understand, you know, what would be the scenario in which reactants or products would be favored. So I'm hopeful that that is helpful. So in this case, then we indicate whether reactants or products are favored. So if you have K, a value of one times 10 to the seven, that's huge, right? So that's gonna be products. If you have 4.5 times 10 to the negative three, it's really small, right? So reactants. If you have 7.9 times 10 to the negative 7, so that gets even smaller, what's favored? Reactants. K equals 1, both. What about 1.56 times 10 to the 2? It's going to be products, right? And 1 times 10 to the negative 5? It's going to be reactants. Okay, so consider the reaction where sulfur trioxide is produced. Okay, so here's a problem in your book, 926. You have sulfur dioxide, and I balance this here, uh, combined with oxygen, okay? So it's gonna undergo oxidation, molecule, uh, not only used oxygen in the oxidation, oxidation state of O2, you know, definitely, you know, got, got changed, but the molecule SO2 actually got bigger, right? SO3, and you have two of them. And heat is given off in this. So what happens if oxygen is added? Well, oxygen is added, obviously, SO3 is formed. You can't form SO3 if oxygen is not there, right? So that's kind of a, it's kind of a, you know, um, uh, you know, a, a chemistry for dummies, if you will, kind of approach, you know, but it's a good one. It's, it's, a, it, it's a good, simple, you know, um, you know, description of what is going on. Well, what happens if we reduce the temperature? If we reduce the temperature, Sulfur trioxide is still favored, but it will be less so. And whenever we mean reduce temperature, we mean on the left-hand side there. So uh, if we were to reduce the ability of oxygen molecules colliding with sulfur dioxide molecules, then although sulfur trioxide will still form, it's gonna do so at a much less, um, at, a, at a much lower level, and the rate is going to also be shifted then. If we were gonna remove SO2, do you think that SO3 is gonna be formed? No. So then SO2, whatever will be left, okay, we didn't remove all of it, um, then only that and the oxygen would be favored. And if you remove oxygen, again, the reactants are still favored. So I hope that that's pretty clear. So that, And that's what they're looking for there in problem 926. So this ought to help you whenever you're doing your homework as well. For chemical equilibrium constant, another example, problem 930 is also pretty good. This is the first step of glycolysis, right? So you have uh, glucose here. It is going to combine with oxygen. Carbon dioxide is going to form. Water is going to form. And energy is going to form. What does that look like? So you burn glucose during exercise. Why do you end up breathing harder as you continue to exercise? So this is a really interesting question, right, that you guys already know. More oxygen is needed to continue your exertion. 
energy production. Otherwise, less energy will be produced if your oxygen supply remains low. So for instance, you cannot get this glucose to, to burn if oxygen levels are not high enough. How do you get that high enough? You have to breathe in, you have to take in more oxygen. Your body's not just gonna take oxygen from nearby sources, okay? It's not gonna do that. If it does that, that means that something else in your body is gonna be decomposing. And that's not gonna be a good situation, okay? You should probably stop exercising if your body starts to, starts to decompose, all right? That's a pretty much given. So you have glucose and you need to be able to convert that to energy, oxygen is required. How do you get more oxygen? You have to breathe more. Whatever gases that had already been stored up in your body at the very initial time of your exercising, well, it's not a problem, right? Your body is efficient and it's gonna retain a certain amount of oxygen and you're gonna be able to exercise. But then ultimately, as you continue to exercise, it's gonna get harder as you go. It's gonna get harder as you go because all of your body is needing oxygen and your lungs need to work harder, not only your lungs, but also all the blood flow, right? Your heart, everything. Kidneys, I mean, everything is working more. So to be able to get into shape, it's a little bit of a challenge, right, for your body. Fortunately, the body can adapt to that. It's very powerful. Our bodies are very amazing. And by being able to breathe more oxygen, by breathing more frequently or, um, well, and really just out of necessity, uh, the energy can be produced, of, of course, until your body says, look, I can't do it anymore. Or, <laughs> or you just get tired of it, right? So what does the above equilibrium expression look like? Well, you would have you know, energy as one of the products, but we don't include that, right? And so that could be you know, the formation, of course, of ATP and whatnot, but let's not include that. Let's only look at the molecular species that are gonna be relatively simple and things that are gonna be typically considered as uh, gases, uh, sometimes liquids, right? But, um, but let's just take a look. Um, you have carbon dioxide, right? And it's raised to the sixth power because it has six moles, water molecules to the sixth power, glucose to the first and oxygen to the sixth, right? Thermal refers to, or energy refers to thermal, kinetic, chemical, all that stuff. Um, that would be, so this would be the example of, of how to construct an equilibrium expression. If you wanted to include energy as well in the numerator, you can do so. I mean, that's fine. That would not be, um, you know, incorrect. So I think that, that could you know, be something, but really if you're looking at the molecular uh, species, that's what you're looking for there. So looking at weak acids and, um, you know, with respect to how they respond, right? As well as the protonated mean carboxylic acids, let's take a look. So you have the carboxylic acid, which you guys are very familiar with by this time, you know, in water, you know, if it's an equilibrium, you're gonna have the hydronium ion that's created or the H plus ion if you just wanna use that, but it's technically correct to do the, the hydronium because you're looking at water as the base in this example, and it's accepting that hydrogen that came from the carboxylic acid to produce, you know, the carboxylic anionic species, and then of course the corresponding hydronium. If you had the protonated amine, this is also, this is also a weak acid, right? It's gonna lose that hydrogen and hydronium ion will be formed and ammonia, which is a base, will be formed as well. So these are two, you know, complete examples, uh, one involving a neutral species, the carboxylic acid, but what about the protonated amine? That's a charge species, okay? And, um, and but they're both considered weak acids and they can produce then, you know, this, this, uh, this alternate form when mixed with water, okay? Again, loss of hydrogen, okay? Oxidize. So let's consider the equilibrium reaction involving acetic acid. We have acetic acid here uh, written on the left. It's CH3COOH, right? So it's a carboxylic acid. We have it with water. We know that one of the that the hydrogen here on the carboxylic acid is going to be lost. It's going to join with water, which is functioning as the base, and then you get the conjugate base of acetic acid, which is the acetate anion. Okay, so you have that. What would that look like? Well, you have the acid, you have the conjugate base, you have the base, and then you have the conjugate acid. It's interesting, right? The H3O plus being considered the conjugate acid. Technically, that is correct, okay? What would your K values look like? Well, let's look. The acetate anion, and how many moles of it do we have? One, 
The hydronium species, how many moles do we have? One. Acetic acid and water each also have one. So you relate to this. And this is where I'm trying to say liquids, which does not include aqueous phase, especially water, contribute minimally to equilibrium conditions and thus equal to one. Okay. So that's important. On the previous slide with the glucose, I mentioned, well, with some of these liquids, we don't always mention those, right? Again, it, you know, if they were aqueous phases, then we would include them. Okay. If they're just liquid phases, then we're not going to include them. So because the acetate anion is an aqueous form, because acetic acid is an aqueous form, and because hydronium is an aqueous form, we include them. Because water, H2O, as that base, is in liquid form and not aqueous form, kind of silly to even think about that, you don't include water. We just assume water is in excess. There's a lot of water. There's a, a large amount of its liquid, and its equilibrium constant is going to be equal to one anyway. So it's not doing anything. In other words, water is not going to be splitting up. It's not going to be breaking into H plus and OH minus, okay? So we leave that as one, okay? So there is your expression. All acids, just that you know, produce a dissociation constant, special type of K, all right? The subscript A, and that refers to a dissociation constant. Polyprotic acids have more than one of those. So if you're talking about phosphoric acid, sulfuric acid, um, uh, goodness, carbonic acid, I mean, all these things, they're going to have more than one dissociation constant. In fact, uh, not only that with respect to stronger acids, but also, you know, weaker acids too, even the carboxylic acids like citric acid will have more than one K. There's actually three, there's not actually three hydrogens that can dissociate from citric acid because there's three hydroxyl groups in carboxylic acid. As a result, you're going to have three different Ka values. Okay, so looking at the Ka value and looking at all these strengths, you can kind of get an idea on where you stand. So this is a table out of your book, table 9.8, and increasing acid strength from bottom, where we have water, going all the way up to the hydrogen sulfate ion, where it's the strongest. You can take a look here. You have the formula that's also given. So in case that helps you, look, you have formic acid too, acetic acid, carbonic acid, you have hydrofluoric acid. Hydrochloric acid isn't uh, in this list, but then again, we're not talking about strong acids, right? These are weak acids, and this is really important. Now, know that, like for instance, in your oral environment, bacteria work to produce lactic acid, some formic acid, acetic acid, and they also um, form pyruvic acid and some other acids during the course of just uh, fermentation of various carbohydrates and or just uh, natively speaking in terms of um, what, what they're digesting from any kind of stored uh, carb carbohydrates that they may have had. So in this case, you're looking at these pKa values, which is the dissociation of one, okay, one of those hydrogen from the species. So the dihydrogen phosphate, I know it has two hydrogens here, the pKa would be 7.18, and then if you did actually the negative log, and you'll see, because we're going to go through that in a minute here, you'll get this K value, this Ka value. The dissociation of one of those hydrogens is going to occur at 7.18, just like how for hydrofluoric acid at 3.19, the dissociation of that hydrogen will separate from fluorine, okay? And just like how in the formic acid at 3.74, you're going to have only one of those hydrogens it's going to come off the hydroxyl group separate, okay? It's just like how it did for in the acetic acid. So it's, it's pretty interesting. One thing that you should notice is that the Ka values are always going to be less than 1. And look at water, man. 1.8 times 10 to the negative 16. It is such a weak acid. That's why we don't usually refer to water as, a, as an acid. And even if it does have some acid character, maybe it's in the presence of a base, right? Then um, it's still going to... Uh, impose very limited weak acid properties in a given molecule. So let's look at acetic acid. We already know that it contains a carboxylic acid, and you know that acetate is the conjugate base. We just discussed that on the previous slide. You're seeing that, again, the hydrogen is separating from that hydroxyl group on that carboxylic acid. In other words, the hydrogen cannot come from the methyl group, okay? 
that bonding is too strong, okay? And where the reaction is going to be is going to be where that oxygen is, okay? So we know this in some of our hydrolysis and condensation experiments. And we also know this from the previous slides that we already talked about here with the with the strong acid or weak acid and, uh, and, and bases uh, mixed in with water, where water functions as the base. So again, here water is the base because acetic acid is functioning as the acid. The conjugate base of acetic acid is going to be the acetate anion. The conjugate acid of water is going to be hydronium. Okay. So uh, actually, let's uh, don't even worry about what's on the bottom half of that screen there. Let's still take a look at what's going on. You have a Ka value of the loss. Okay, that speaks to the loss of that hydrogen from that hydroxyl group on the carboxylic acid has been determined to be 1.75 times 10 to the negative 5. How was that determined? Through experimentation. Okay, we just didn't pull that number out of, out of anywhere, right? I mean, it was just um, a lot of experimentation had to go through, usually done with titrations to figure out well, where is that endpoint going to be whenever that hydrogen starts to separate from that acid. If you do the pKa, which if you were to use your calculator, you have to be negative log of that number. And whenever you're putting this in the calculator, by the way, make sure you have parentheses around the 1.75 times 10 to the negative five. Otherwise the calculator may do 1.75 first, take you know, the negative log of that and then multiply it by 10 to, 10 to the negative five and you're gonna get a nonsensical answer. So see that you can get this number. You should definitely do this on your own and make sure you're proficient at this. But the pKa is gonna be 4.76. And this is what the equilibrium would look like. You would have the, again, the acetate in the numerator of the hydronium in the numerator, acetic acid, the carboxylic acid in the denominator, and water would also be in the, den in the, in the den denominator, even though, yes, it is a liquid, and yes, it will be one. I'm just showing you this to be pedantic about it, just to keep track of all of the, all of the um, molecules that are in this reaction. Likewise, if you're going to have the ammonium ion plus water and again here water is acting as the base hydronium is the conjugate acid the ammonium ion here this ammonium is the acid and ammonia is the conjugate base what is the ka value for the for the splitting of one of those hydrogens from ammonium 6.3 times 10 to the negative 10. the pka value is 9.2 and here would be the expression that you would have you have any nh4 Right, raise to the first, everything is to the first because this is a very simple example where stoichiometry just works out, one, 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 okay? That would be the example. You have all these K values, okay? PKA is negative log KA. If we're talking about, you know, this uh, KA and acid strength, again, we just talked about all those, you know, I'm gonna add in here hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, the pKa is 11.62, meaning that's 2.4 times 10 to the negative 12. It's not going to want to associate very well unless the, unless you have very, very, um, you know, basic conditions here. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to show you. Again, and all the Ka values are less than 1. Here you have an instance of where you have um, peroxide and, and, and water. I'm just trying to show you here, right, with respect to the dissociation of hydrogen peroxide, if it were to happen. You have the pKa value 11.62. If you take the negative log of that, you're going to get, um, well, actually, the negative log of the Ka value is 11.62. If you're, you're going to um, do the inverse of that, then you get 2.4 times 10 to the negative 12. The whole point is you have, you know, the conjugate base, right, looking like this O2H negative. Where's that coming from? It's coming from hydrogen peroxide, if we're considering that the acid. Water as the base and water's conjugate acid is the hydronium species. If you were to put that into an equilibrium expression, that is what you would get. Okay. The point is, this is so small, 2.4 times 10 to the negative 12, that this, that this dissociation is so unlikely to occur. All right. It's not going to happen. And, you know, can it happen? Of course it can happen, but it's just not going to. Rather, you know from some of the earlier experiments that we did is that hydrogen peroxide is very susceptible to UV light and some visible light usually has to be stored in an opaque bottle and left alone for a little bit of time especially 
uh, if it's um, exposed to the atmosphere, which is even further frustrated, it'll naturally decompose into water and it'll also evolve oxygen gas. We can actually make this uh, reaction occur expeditiously using, using potassium iodide and using like a base catalyzed environment, i.e. using like dish detergent, which I showed you before whenever we made the elephant toothpaste. So we can, we can think about that. But these are just very, you know, this is just an exception and this is how, and this is why also hydrogen peroxide hasn't been included in that table of weak acids. Okay, so it's so it's so small this Ka value, but more importantly, you know the kinetics and the properties of, of hydrogen peroxide say it's really not going to dissociate. You're not going to get hydrogen peroxide going to a conjugate base. Oh no! Instead, you're going to get um, hydrogen peroxide decomposing to water, and in the process, it's going to evolve oxygen. So let's talk a little bit more. We're almost done with this webinar for today, but I, since we are talking about KAs, we might as well talk about the acid strength of the strong acids. Notice how these are so much greater. Look at hydrochloric acid, one times 10 to the sixth. This means then that hydrogen is going to easily, quite easily, readily split from the rest of the hydrochloric acid intact molecule. You can see that hydroiodic is a, is a, is a particular beast here at 3.2 times 10 to the negative nine. Okay, so these are differences between strong and weak acids. The Ka values here are much greater than one, right? You have hydrobromic acid, base uh, of water, they combine. Again, you have bromine, uh, aqueous base, and hydronium ion, aqueous base, serving as the conjugate base of hydrobromic acid and, of course, conjugate acid to water, respectively. If you were to construct that Ka relationship, you would talk about the products, right? And they're both raised to the first power because the stoichiometry is such that it's one, 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 and one, right? One HBr, one H2O, one Br minus, and one H3O plus. But again, the water, if it's just liquid, doesn't that just go to one? So that's why you're left with that. Okay. So to further talk just a little bit more about the auto ionization of water, I think that this is important because everything has to do with respect to water. Water is our reference point almost here. Water can act as the base and as the acid, and you then have a conjugate acid and a conjugate base. So what do you have in this relationship? Well, if you were to write H2O plus H2O, you'll say a conjugate acid, H3O plus, and a conjugate base, OH minus, what would that look like? Well, here's your equilibrium expression. You would have H3O plus, Okay, concentration, everything, by the way, is a one to one to one to one ratio. So your stoichiometry is going to only have ones in them, right? So that's why everything's raised to the first power. You know that the liquids are going to be um, uh, raised to, you know, to each of the, of, of the first power. But this is also why they kind of just factor out, right? One times one is one. So then you're left with just H3O plus and OH minus because that's what survives in the numerator. Well, in that particular unique situation, instead of calling it Ka, we're calling it Kw for water, okay? And just so that you know, the Kw or the auto-ionization, you call it auto-ionization, you call it dissociation, whatever, um, both are uh, technically correct. It's one times 10 to the negative 14 at 25 degrees Celsius. And what does that mean? Well, in the acidic environment, you're going to have a higher concentration of H3O plus. You guys know this, and usually you might not see the H3O plus. Again, I said that usually um, H plus, the proton, is just used with respect to this. But if you really want to be pedantic about it, you could talk about it as H3O plus. All right. Uh, in basic cis situations, obviously the hydroxyl group will dominate. Neutral H3O plus plus OH minus are similar. Okay. And then that gives rise to a concept of pH. So why don't we end the webinar here and we will start then with the part two, uh, talking about the ionization of water and then we'll introduce the concept of pH. <laughs>